Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to The Debrief with your friends here at Sandals Church, where every week Pastor Matt gives us real answers to your tough questions from the Bible. I am Stephanie Schaefer. And I am Tim Holly Tamale. Wow. Tamale. Or as, what have I, what have I been calling you lately? Uh, Tim Dog Millionaire. Tim Dog Millionaire, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like that I like one. how you pause, like, oh, do I have to tell everyone? I just had to cycle through yeah, the ones the that nicknames. recently have. Well, yeah. because I, I have to give people nicknames because really re, remembering real names yeah. with the amount of name is impossible. After, after our Denver flight, you called me frequent flyer for the first few days. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a nickname guy. Guys, yeah, he, he would literally walk in the room, hey, frequent flyer, how you doing? I was like, yeah. I'm still not dead. I'm still so, yeah. not God. flying ever again. Yeah. So. Well, I learned the heart of the champion is yeah. not in you. The eye of the tiger the is, eye not, of the tiger is, is not within me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, man. Oh, man. By the way, I was talking to Tyler, and he said electric shaver was I know, he like, didn't he's like, like it. Oh, like I heard that from kids in kindergarten. Tyler, I'm sorry. I'm slow at this yeah. game. Yeah. yeah. The PMB is mentoring me in my mm-hmm. nickname, uh, yeah. wordsmithing, <laughs> but I'll do better next the time. The problem is, I give so many nicknames, I, I can't remember yeah. them sometimes. Oh, that's hard. Like we were talking to this guy on staff, I used to call him Mary Gary. Oh, yes. Because <laughs> he was in charge well, of marriage. Sherry Gary. He's we a had jolly Sherry guy. Gary, who mm-hmm. was in charge of evangelism. Because I couldn't remember one part. Yeah. So we used to have two Kellys on staff. I called one Kelly Dark and one Kelly Light, but mm-hmm. then they changed their hair colors. Mm-hmm. So oh. it screwed me up. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that it was yeah. their hair color. Well, I still know, like, yeah. oh, I'm talking about Kelly Light. No, here. if so it that. was because of their skin color, you that's would, called racism. Exactly. Yes. We are not about that here no. on the DB. For the record, listeners, they were both white with different colored hair. So that's settled. Yeah. <laughs> I feel better. In now. our current culture and climate, we must distinguish. Ah, yes. Okay. I appreciate yeah. all of your Good. distinguishment. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm Pastor Very Matt Brown. Yes. PMB. Here, PMB. Yes. All right. Well, we've got a great episode in store. Uh, we've got some really great off-topic questions that are going to come at the end of this episode. So make sure you stick around. We're going to talk about where exactly did Jesus go after he died, but before Whoa. he rose from the dead mm-hmm. and what to do when people refuse to forgive you. But we're going to save those to the very end of the episode because we have got some really great stuff to follow up on from l- uh, last episode and your message this weekend, which has brought in tons of questions. We've talked about work and work. Sometimes it's hard. Not when Not you work you. here though. Not I have for the you. best job in the world so the it's great, hard for well, me to understand yeah you have the greatest boss because you I have, have the, the deepest the level of meaning and encouragement i would I say maybe i have the best job which yes. was oh, formerly your true. job that was formerly mm-hmm. my we job we traded off we mm-hmm. did and so i am mourning the fact that i don't get to assist the best boss in the mm-hmm. entire world anymore. and i am rejoicing at my yeah. continued opportunity yes yeah. which hopefully so, lasts through the day while we have never struggled in our jobs we Many we do have do. some people who yeah. have some questions about their jobs yes 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 all right well we're going to dive in first though with a question from Alyssa's group she had a follow-up question from the who we are series which is mm. all about how we serve and why Whoa, we this serve. Is a way back question. I know. Throwing, I know. It back. Throwing it back. Yeah. So Alyssa wrote in and said, during the Who We Are series, our small group talked about the importance of serving others, not just at church, but in our day to day jobs too. One question we had was, how do we serve fully, but also make sure that we're not being taken advantage of? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess the question is at church, right? Yes. Well, yeah. the, the question was not necessarily at church, but also like in your job or in life or... Well, I mean, it's just healthy boundaries. So, you, I mean, you have to have boundaries. You, you do get paid for your work. And so you need to do and ask yourself, you know, is this is this normal? Um, I think there are seasons where maybe you work a little bit harder, but you can't, you can't have that be the expectation all the time. And so there are times when you got to run a little faster and there are times when you got to do normal work because you can't, you can't remain at a high octane level or you're going to burn out. And so any good boss will know that, that a, a, uh, a hardworking employee is one who's been well rested. So you have to run through those cycles. So, um, you know, I think that's a great, great question. First thing I would say is work for a boss who not only, not only cares about your productivity, but cares about you. And mm-hmm. so that's what I try to do at Sandals Church is care both about the person uh, at, at work and the productivity that they accomplish. And because I think those things go hand in hand, and I think that's who God's called us to be. God cares both about our work that he's called us to do, and he cares about the person that we are, which is why he says, six days you shall work, one day you shall rest. So a lot of people flip that, right? Six days off, one day's working, that's called sin, laziness, and you need to get over yourself. Listen to this week's message because Amen. you need to be willing to work hard, and a lot of young people aren't. But a lot of people who work hard need, need to be willing to take you know, rest, and, and rest means not thinking about work, not... You know, my wife and I have to have this argument over and over again. Like we're on date night, we're on vacation. I do not want to talk about the church, talk about our kids, talk about our life, talk about whatever you want to talk about, but do not talk about church because it's our work life. And, it, and if it's constantly a part of that, we're not resting. We're not taking a Sabbath. Mm-hmm. So, so um, again, th- th- this is just my advice. Um, don't be worried so much about the job you're getting, but the boss you're following. That's what I would look for because a great boss is going to make any job great. 
And so, um, again, I, I think many of us have the wrong target. I mm -hmm. want the right career rather than following right leadership. And so one of the reasons why I think people enjoy working at Sandals is because they enjoy the leadership here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so because we care both about productivity and the person. Uh, I care deeply about like your new marriage that's what, yeah. a month old? Yeah. Yeah, a month old. I care about your singleness, okay? And I, I care about those things, but I also care about you getting your stuff done. And mm -hmm. we need to have those talks and, and, and balance both of those. And so- yeah. um, that's what I would do is pick a healthy boss, pilk, pilk. It's a new word. Yeah, yeah. it's like pick while drinking milk, yeah. pilk. So um, I don't like that. You pick, pick a boss who is going to lead you and try to find that person. And again, uh, it, it's the same reason I tell people all the time, before you move, pick a church. Don't move and then yeah. try to find a church because mm -hmm. we get that complaint all the time yep. because you have the wrong focus right. in moving. Don't focus on your career, focus on your Christ-centered life and things are going to be dramatically better. So, yeah, that's great. That's so true. Yeah. I feel that I see that in, this is the best job I've ever had. Mm. And, and the, I would say one of the, even better I, than serving coffee, even better. Mm. And the reason being is, is you and pastor Dan, Oh, thank oh, you guys. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, I mean that, that, yeah. That. If you guys don't know who pastor Dan is, he's our executive pastor. We need to bring him out. He's like the, he's like the sandals mole. Oh we should have like no mom. one knows we who he get, is, but he is our XP him. and he is fantastic. Is oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. But yes. that's, that's it. I mean, mm. th following you guys has been the biggest blessing and has brought the greatest amount of joy, I think, in, in this job. So mm. thanks. Cool. All right. Well, let's keep on talking about uh, jobs and work. Your message this weekend was all about what to do when your job's not making you happy. Right. And so we got tons of questions on this. You're still going through the book of Philippians here as we're walking through the Beyond Happy series. So there are actually a couple of verses in Philippians that we wanted to kind of break down a little bit more before mm -hmm. we get into some more questions about jobs. Uh, so this first one, um, the verse is fix your... Philippians 4, 8, it says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Yeah. So the question following that, how do we do this while also being aware of and real about the bad, hard things in life? Right. So just know this is that as human beings, we are more negative than positive by nature. That, that's just how most of us are, which is why Paul says one final thing, focus on the positive because we are overly focused on the negative. And, and usually it's negative things we can't change, which is why we're miserable. Mm. So I wanna focus my, I wanna change my circumstances, the people around me, I wanna change all, I can't change any of those things and so I focus on those and so I feel bad and what I need to focus is on myself, what can I change? And so what is the one final thing? Focus on your outlook, try to look for the positive in life, try to look for the honorable, the good and the true. It doesn't mean we're pie in the sky people, it doesn't, our vision is to be real, sometimes, you know, we need to talk about what's difficult in life. And, um, you know, we need to be real about our relationships, our friendships. You know, sometimes when I go to small group, you know, and people say, how are you and Tammy doing? I need to say, we, we were fought all the way here. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what's amazing? Here, here's why that's important to be real there is because maybe another couple did. And truly having a great experience at small group is us not pretending, but us being real. And mm -hmm. we're going to go away going, mm -hmm. okay, every couple struggles, every couple has challenges. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, but again, in that struggles in marriage are overwhelming when all you do is focus on the negative. Like if I just make a list of everything about Tammy that I don't like, I'm going to want to divorce her. That's the reality. If I just focus on those things. So what I have to do is I have to minimize things because there is no perfect person. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist. So I have to, you know, really, really appreciate, um, who she is and focus on the positives and what do I love about her and what mm. do I appreciate about her. And so, um, you know, again, I think that most of our unhappiness comes from an unhealthy level of expectation. We expect our spouses to be perfect in every way, shape or form. And no one is um, like at your wedding, someone made the comment, uh, Tyler and Stephanie are perfect for each other. And I mm. said, no, they are not. <laughs> no. They're not. You should see Sorry, when we Steph. disagree. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're, they're not. Now, they're compatible for each other. I think that's I think that's a fair assessment. They're mm -hmm. attracted to each other. They are spiritually anchored with each other. Those are good things. Mm -hmm. But marriage is going to be a significant challenge. And when we say things like they're perfect for each other, then we don't have a category for fighting. We don't have a category for disagreement. And then we feel like, oh my gosh, my marriage is unraveling because we have to actually work mm -hmm. through some things. And so... Um, you know, I, I think what we need to do is we need to identify what are healthy expectations, mm -hmm. what, what are godly expectations. Like I shouldn't have no expectations in my marriage. Mm -hmm. I expect Tammy, Tammy to be morally faithful, sexually faithful to me. Mm -hmm. I think she should expect that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a natural, normal expectation. Tammy should expect that I don't physically abuse her. I think that's right. That's a, that's a good expectation. 
Uh, however, her expecting me to always discern how she feels is unreliable. Me expecting, you know, her to uh, meet all of my sexual desires whenever I have them, that's that's ridiculous. And, and that's where we get into these things where it's like, man, your level of expectation is not in reality and um, you, you need to you need to be able to discern what is a healthy normal expectation mm-hmm. um, like for example I think if you're a wife your husband should be emotionally available an unhealthy expectation is that he will meet all of your needs and emotions mm-hmm. that's not fair mm-hmm. um, so you're going to need other women and other friends to help fill that tank because you have a greater capacity for emotional intimacy than most men that's not always true sometimes it's the guy I mean you mm-hmm. know sometimes we flip flop roles and that's fine um, so you have to figure that out. Yeah. Totally. Well, and I would say even too, like someone being perfect for you, like I think a lot of what marriage is, is right. It's sanctifying. It's changing you. It's growing into who God wants you to be. So even those arguments, even those disagreements, like looking at those as opportunities to be grown and be changed. It's mm-hmm. hard to do in the moment. Right. When- yeah. For example, I mean, one of the beauties of, of birthing a child is the pain that the wife goes through. Mm-hmm. It enhances mm-hmm. the suffering, enhances the enjoyment. Mm-hmm. It does. And so what we want is we want love to be birthed with no labor. And, and, and truly, right, Ooh. love brings, yeah. l- true love comes forth through pain, which is why Jesus Christ labors on the cross and brings new life yeah. into the kingdom. Wow. So there's this picture of this. And so everybody wants, you know, the honeymoon without, you know, the, the real work. Yeah. And so truly, um, I, I think we, we need to reprogram our lives of, of what happiness really is because... If, if you have the wrong target, you're never going to achieve happiness. You're, you're always going to be miserable. And so we, we need to really, really rethink that. So, yeah. Mm, that's really good. Yeah. All right. Another verse that uh, you used in your notes this weekend from Philippians was Philippians 2.12, which says, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. So what exactly does it mean to obey God with fear when like we're already in this new life where we've been saved by Jesus? Yeah. So what Paul's actually means there is not just simply fearing God, but fearing the process that God is working in you, having a deep respect and awe for what God is doing in you. So I Mm. said, I memorized this verse this way, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you according to his will and purpose, right? So God is doing something in me and I have to have great reverence for that in me. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is really what happens when I'm maximizing uh, the stress of my surroundings, I'm minimizing the work of God in me. So when I'm maximizing the work, you know, the, the, the effects of life around me, I'm minimizing the work of God in me. So I need to constantly have a deep reverence, a sense of fear, a holy awe for what God is doing mm-hmm. inside me because it is truly incredible what happens. And, um, you know, for example, and I, and I think that there's there's great joy in that. So like, for example, one of the reasons you know, people don't appreciate their health as they expect to be happy every single day. Mm. Okay, but a couple of weeks ago when I had the mole removed from my head um, and there's a chance, you know, the doctor says, you know, you never like to hear a doctor say, I don't like the way that mole looks. Mm-mm. Like we need to extract that because that doesn't, you yeah. know, when your dermatologist says that mole, it doesn't give like, me a good feeling. Mm-hmm. Okay, right. So I'm on the phone with the nurse who's telling me whether or not this is cancer. So she says, it's not cancer. All of a sudden I'm overjoyed because I did not have the expectation of health, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It, I should feel that way every day. I don't pr- presently have cancer. Why am I not celebrating? Why am I not having more enjoyment and more life? Because I expect to be healthy every day. So we've yeah. got to really, really adjust. So that's why I think we're, we're really, really miserable and we've got to focus on, okay, this is a challenging day. This is not going my way. Um, God is doing something in me. And, and I, I don't want this to sound... I don't want this to sound arrogant or, or boisterous or whatever, but part of the reason you're in your car listening to me talk and, and teach you how to live life is because of the struggle that God has allowed me to go through. And without those struggles that I did not want, that I prayed that would go away, yeah. that I was embittered about God, and, and it didn't make sense to me. Without those things, I cannot be the spiritual leader you need today. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I, I did not appreciate at the time the work of God in me. I was not working out my salvation with fear and trembling for it is God has worked in you according to his will. I, I wasn't doing that. And so that's what it means to have a deep reverence and fear. Um, I was talking with a young lady last night from our church. Uh, she's 22, so I'm 46. So I said, look, man, if I could go back and be in your shoes, I just would say this. God has a plan and it won't make sense, but he knows what he's doing. Mm. Now, here's the sad thing is, I can say that all day long to her. 
How's the only way she's going to experience that? Is by going through a little crap so she can experience Christ. That's mm -hmm. the reality, right? She, he, he, God has got to take you through the valley of the shadow of death so you can appreciate the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's the purpose of life. Um, I said this a couple of weeks ago. Suffering provides contrast for joy. Mm -hmm. If we were always happy and never experienced suffering, we wouldn't know what happiness is. Yeah. Yeah. And so part of the reason um, you need to embrace the intensity of conflict and disagreement and even suffering in relationship is so that you can experience the good times. And so what makes, you know, when my daughters graduate high school and, and in the next couple of years they'll graduate college, what will make me so joyful on that day is the struggle. Mm -hmm. It's what went into it, that the amount of effort and time and, and difficulty and, um, you know, and I've worked really, really hard at preparing my girls for that. Both of them did mountain biking, which is like the most difficult high school sport there is. Like not a lot of fun, a lot of hard work. Mm. And both girls wanted to quit one season. And I told them, I do not want you to quit. And they said, but it's hard. I said, exactly. Mm. So is life. And there's going to be times in school when you want to drop out. There's going to be times in marriage when you want to give up. There's going to be times in your faith when you're not feeling God and you want to walk away. Mm. Don't miss out on the blessings of God by walking away from the work. And that's what Paul's saying here. Mm. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Understand this, church in Philippi, you guys are going through a hard time, but God has a purpose in this. Mm. So we got to go back to Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will carry on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God's going to work it out. You have to trust God. And the yeah. preceding verse, this is why it's so important that we look at a book in its context. What is the source of encouragement? Not your suffering, it's Christ's suffering. And we know that Christ suffered, but he was raised yeah. and he was elevated. Hmm. And there's gonna be this great party and we're gonna experience that. And so no matter what suffering we go through in life, the magnification of our joy in comparison to that suffering in the next life will be incomparable, right? Hmm. Yeah. Paul says you cannot imagine what God has in store for you. Paul says that. You, I can imagine a lot. Right. You can't imagine what God has in store for those he loves and is called according to his purpose. So Romans 8, 28, God works all things for good to those who love him. That's key. Mm. To those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So I don't believe God is causing all of these bad things in your life. Here's what God can do. God can cause those bad things to work out for good because he loves you. Yeah. So he's going to, he's not going to withhold painful experiences from your life. He's actually going to allow them. And then from that difficulty, like Job says, when God is finished, I will come forth as gold. Job mm. says that mm. in the middle of his suffering. Yeah, I know, I know my redeemer lives, Job says. And yeah. when he's done with me, I'm going to be better for it. And uh, man, that's hard. It's hard when you don't have the money to make a house payment. It's hard when your kids are driving you crazy. Um, you know, uh, I mean, children, um, you don't have kids yet, bring a great amount of joy and they bring a great amount of heartache. They bring both. And any parent that is not ready for that is not ready to be a parent. And so, I mean, if you think about it, you know, um, I know many of you are, are parents and being a parent is the closest thing to having to be God that you will ever experience because you are totally in charge. You are 100% in charge of a little person's life. You are God to them. And it, I mean, think, think about how long it takes to become a doctor. And a doctor performs, you're performing surgery on someone's life. Mm -hmm. And uh, no wonder we all come out of the shoot screwed up, you know, because our parents, <laughs> our parents don't know what they're doing. They haven't had training, you know, it's just like, you're, you're trying to figure it out. And um, it, it's very, very difficult. The longer I've been a parent, the more grace I've had for my parents yeah. hmm. because uh, they didn't know. Um, and man, you know, everything I've learned, I've learned through mistakes. So, all right. Wow. Long answer. No. That was amazing. That was great. Oh, and it's super encouraging too. Cause I think, I don't know when I like approach anything that looks like suffering or looks like, Oh, this is going to be hard. Like I want to avoid it. I want to like push away. I want to get away from that. And that just reminder that, yeah, that suffering is actually going to produce yeah. really good things and you won't experience the really, really good unless you yeah. let yourself go through that. Well, I, th I think our society believes all hard things are bad things. Mm. And that is not a true nope. thing. It's, yeah. not. it's not, true. it's not. So, um, actually I had someone comment on my, um, uh, I can't remember what it was my Instagram or my Twitter, but you know, I preached on that, you know, lower your expectations and you'll find happiness. And they actually said, our, our church said the exact opposite thing. And so what I wanted to say is your church is wrong because what, what that person is doing, a lot of pastors act like cheerleaders when they need to act like coaches. Hmm. I'm not your cheerleader, I'm your coach. And a coach works you through difficulty, right? Mm -hmm. I got to pick you up when you're down. I got I to push you through this. So a yeah. cheerleader 
is constantly celebrating, and, and cheerleaders are completely divorced from the reality of games. Well, they're not even watching the game. <laughs> right? <laughs> they're facing yeah, the well, crowd. You know, you could be losing by 50, and they're going, we're number one, we're not, you know, it's, it's like, like well, not, okay. Yeah. Yeah, right, and I'm not bagging on sorry, cheerleaders, cheerleaders yeah. you know. Yeah. We, we love you. you. And, they have a different job. Yeah, you have a different job. So, um, you know, I'm not your I'm not your cheerleader. I'm your coach, and I'm trying to help you be a better person mm-hmm. and, and, and help you not be overwhelmed by the difficulties of life mm-hmm. um, because you can work through it, and you can find joy in the midst of difficulty. I mean, you know, we have people in our church who are paralyzed, and some of them are very, very happy people. Mm-hmm. And we have people in our church who are disabled, and they're miserable. You can't say... What happened to them in their life caused their misery. What's caused their misery is their reaction to what happened to them in their life. Same things, same things. I see people, same diseases. I see people with same illnesses, same accidents, same catastrophic accidents. What's different is their response to the event, not the event itself. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, life is different. Life is very, very different for me after eight knee surgeries. It's very, very different, but I still have happiness. Yeah. So, boom. Right. That's yeah. awesome. Thanks, Pastor Matt. Uh, Terrence wrote in a question. Uh, this is kind of pertaining to uh, job, kind of the work life. How does one discern if it is necessary to stay in your current position because God has further purpose and growth for you there, or if it's time to leave that position for something new? Yeah. So, again, community, 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 community. Bring it before the church. You know, um, um, you know, I just, man, I just offered a job to uh, a good friend of mine and, um, you know, who's, who spent some time praying, going before the Lord and really felt like yeah, that wasn't the job for them. Um, you know, I, I respect and, and honor that decision, but I, I still think oftentimes those decisions are best made within the context of community. But um, I, I appreciated him going before the Lord. I think that's one part of it. The next part of it is is to, is to look at community and and say, you know, is this you know, where I should go or not. Cause really this, this was an opportunity for my friend to change career. So both opportunities were ministry. He's serving God in both places. So mm. it's not a matter of, you know, one place is, right. is more of the center of God's will versus the other. It was just, you know, what do you do? Um, and, and the truth is he's dynamic where he is. And I believe he would have been dynamic on our team. So you, you have to have community uh, in that. And so uh, just evaluate. And again, you need to be real with yourself. Okay. What, what do I need to learn at my current job? So like, for example, my first job, when I started Channel's Church, one of the first things I learned was, okay, I don't want to run my business this way, right? So everybody's like, this place is terrible. What are you learning? What you may be learning is how not, what, what kind of work environment you don't want to be in. Mm. What kind of manager you don't want to work for. What kind of leader you don't want. You know, I mean, it's just like so many of these people, you know, you know a woman will say, well, I've dated five men and, and I hate all men now. Well, maybe the problem isn't men. Maybe the problem is your selection of men. And so what a woman in that case is not learning is she's not learning what she doesn't want. Mm -hmm. She keeps duplicating the Mm -hmm. same event over and over and over again. And so same thing like with your finances. If, If you're constantly bad at your money, what do you need to change? Yeah. You know, so what, what, what do you need to change to adjust your life so that you can find the happiness that you desire? And, and, and really, um, you know, to be happy, two things has to change. One of two things. One is what we think will make us happy, or two is us. What do I need to do to attain that? Like I, something has to change, either my goal or me. Mm-hmm. And and the truth is we don't change our goal and we don't change what we do. And so we're stuck in misery. One, one of two things has to happen. So like something has to change, the goal or me. <laughs> and and we, have to, we have to decide that. So I would just say, look at yourself and say, okay, and, and I would say this, in any job, you can learn something. And, and, and the bottom line is, we said this week, right? M- meaning, or, or I, I believe loving what you do comes from meaning. Not all jobs are fun. And that's what I think most people are saying. I think most people are lying to themselves. Mm-hmm. My job's not fun. Well, my job's not always fun. Mm-hmm. It's not. Mm-hmm. But it does provide meaning. Mm-hmm. So, so where's the meaning that you get from your life? And I think you, you, meaning gives you the ability to love what you do. And, and you learn to love what you do by loving, helping people. Like even, you know, a lot of our people in our church, you know, they're going to school and it's so tragic. Going to school so I don't have to be a waiter anymore. It's like, man, if you're a waiter or a waitress, you have the opportunity to bless people with a night out, to bless people with a, with a moment away, yeah. to bless people on date nights, to bless mom without a night where she doesn't have to cook or clean or, mm-hmm. you know, a family. You, know, you have an opportunity to let people have a Sabbath from their life. Right. Why wouldn't you love doing that? Now, I'm not saying you want to do that forever, 
but don't act like it's meaningless. Working in a restaurant, working in the service industry is meaning. It is. It's your motivation, I think a lot of times is fun rather than service and learn to serve and help people. And man, I, I, I love doing that. Uh, I love helping people. Like that's the reason I was so excited to lead that woman to the Lord yeah. uh, this weekend was because I helped her connect with God. Mm-hmm. And I was able to do that. And, and here's the truth. I had nothing to do with my job. My job is to preach, teach, a- and lead. I, my job is not to personally one-on-one lead people to Christ. I get to do that. Because I had the opportunity. Yeah. And, and just like a lot of the people that, you know, leading people to Christ is not in your job description, but you may have the opportunity because of your job. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, take advantage of that. And when can you, um, you know, find meaning? So, so I would just say, work that out in community, literally come up with a pros and cons list and, and, and invite people to be brutally honest in your life. Most people, even when people ask me for their thoughts, most people don't want my thoughts. What people want is a rubber stamp on what they've already decided. Yeah. And here's what I've decided. If you've already decided, I'm not saying anything. Why do I want that conflict? I've already decided I'm not going to wrestle with you over things you don't want to hear. I don't do that. Mm. I don't try to lead people who don't want to be led. Feel free to be stupid. Feel free, <laughs> right? I, I Again, I, I do not feel the need to control stupid people. I just do not. Feel free. Throw your life away. It is your life. Mm. I'm not in charge of your soul. You know, God is and you are. So figure it out. Yeah. So I, I just, I just don't do that. So, um, you know, really, really ask yourself and ask people early. Mm-hmm. Don't yeah. ask people late. Don't ask people when you got to make a decision tomorrow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bring, bring me in early. You know, um, it drives me crazy when we have people at Sandals that, you know, got a job offer from somewhere else. And they're like, yeah, I want you to pray into this. Well, when do they want a decision today? <laughs> <Tomorrow>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, yeah, no, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. That's great advice. Just even in, in discerning what, what God's will is. And this actual question that we got coming up is a, kind of along those lines, you know, uh, coming in from an anonymous uh, person, how can you know if God is closing the door on you from a particular career path that you feel called to do? Yeah. So again, man, how do you know if the door is being closed? How do you know if I, you know, I just seem to keep pressing. At what point is man, God really... How do we discern what yeah, he's speaking? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> so what I would do is I would get in a circle of friends and community group that know me, know mm-hmm. my skill set, and people that can just be honest with me. I mean, yeah. sometimes, right, it's not our calling, it's our desire. Like, what if I told you I just really feel called to be a professional basketball player? Like, I feel like that's my calling, yeah. you know? Okay, sometimes what you perceive to be your... Here, here's how you know. If it's not your gifting, it's not your calling. Mm. Why would God call you to something and not gift you to do it? Like when people say, I just really feel like my gift is music and God's blessed me with a desire to sing. Yeah, but you can't sing. All right. <laughs> so let's say like, cause we actually got another question that's similar to that. What, what if you are gifted in an area, but it's something like singing or something creativity, like that doesn't naturally translate into a normal job. How do you maybe pursue something in that gifting while still needing to maybe provide for yourself, provide for your family? Yeah, sure. And what I would say, if you're a musician artist, you know, most musicians never, most actors never get to use their, uh, their hobby as their craft. Like for example, I like, I like uh, riding my mountain bike. I don't, I don't expect it to provide for my family. I do mm-hmm. it on the side. Mm-hmm. Right. Why wouldn't you do that with music? Why, 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 why? That, that's the thing is, is we feel like our jobs are so supposed to supply all of our needs for happiness. Man, again, and this is w- what I want to say is, is what provides me with happiness is not the fun of my job, it's meaning. So, so what is the meaning of my job? And let me just start here. Number one, my job allows me to provide for my family. That gives me meaning. Mm. Gives me meaning, gives me purpose. And so, you know, and that's how you know if you're operating out of selfishness or godliness. Godliness is the joy that comes from serving others. I get to serve my wife, provide for my children, clothe them, house them, take care of them. So it allows me to do that at a level that's, I don't think, you know, ridiculous or whatever. And I, I'm able to do that. Next, my job allows me to give to the Lord. I want to have a job that allows me to give at least 10% of my income to the local church. That's important to me. Yeah. So I need to make enough money so that I can pay my bills and give God 10% because the, I believe that honors God and it gives me meaning. Mm. Money for me is meaningless. Making a difference brings meaning. And I believe that when I give my money to the church, I believe this church is making a difference. Next, I want money to be able to support missionaries over and above my 10%. You know, my wife and I's prayer is that we, and we're getting close 
to where the biggest checks we write a month are to God and his kingdom, mm. not to me and my kingdom. That's What's awesome. me and my kingdom? My house, my car, my insurance. And most people never ever think that way. Yeah. I wanna be giving more to God than I am to myself. That's the long-term goal of my life because it gives me meaning. It gives me purpose. And, and I wanna be able to do that. And most people never ever yeah. think about that. You know, They, they wanna get out of debt so they can retire and sit on their butts. I wanna get out of debt so I can live for God and his kingdom and be fully able to support God and to be able to do things for my church. And if, if Sandals needs a big check, I wanna be the guy that doesn't just have to ask for it. I wanna be the guy that can write it. Mm. That's my goal. Yeah. Um, so that, that's what gives me meaning. So, so providing for my family, giving to God and his kingdom. Um, and then I think the benefit is I get to have a job that provides, I, I get to be a pastor. Obviously I have meaning for that. But listen, to get here, I didn't have jobs that were right. the end all be all. I did whatever it took to plant this church. And people don't want to recognize that. So I am where I am today because I suffered yesterday. Mm. And so people see me and they go, I'm going to be just like that. And I was like, well, that's a, that's a hard road. Yeah. Mm. Right? So James and John in the Bible tell Jesus, we want to sit at your right hand. And Jesus says, you have no idea what you're asking for. Mm. So they want the glory without the gore. Yeah. That's what they wanted. And, mm. and that's what a lot of people want. Jesus says, James, John. And they're like, no, no, no. We talked to our mom about it. <laughs> Yeah, she's so always good. a good place to start. She's good. Yeah. Mom said yeah. ask you. Yeah. Mom said. So wait, let me get this straight. Your mom wants great things for you. That's strange. <laughs> right. First mom in history. Yeah, that's want the oddest thing, thing that a mother yeah. wanted her Super sons unique. Mm -hmm. to be two and three. They can't right. be one because that's Jesus, yeah. but two and three, yeah. right? I mean, she's you a Christian. So yeah, she no, no, she's it. a follower of Jesus. So it's okay with her sons being two <laughs> and three. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So uh, Jesus is saying, you have, no, you have no idea. And this is why I said this week in the church, if you're having struggles in your life, it means God wants to do great things with you. Yeah. And if your life is easy... Thank you. If your life is easy, aggressive. man, then, then maybe God has no purpose for your life. Quit, quit, quit looking around at these people and saying, oh my gosh, they have it so easy. Maybe that means God has no meaning for them. Mm. Right? I mean, Romans 1, read Romans 1. The worst thing that can happen, man, is you worship yeah. the, the creation mm -hmm. rather than the, the creator. creator. Yeah. So we think happiness comes from enjoying the things that God gives when happiness comes from the giver of good things. You better go ahead. Yeah. So, right? So that's that's what we need to do. And, and and that's what's devoid in our culture. Yeah. We have the culture with the most things and we're the most miserable. Mm -hmm. Come on, even atheists, get, you know, give me an amen. Something's wrong. And by the way, atheists, listen to me. If we live in a purposeless, meaningless universe, there is no meaning. How do you find meaning? Yeah, it's miserable. But if there's a gracious, loving God, and there's a purpose behind all this crap, mm -hmm. I think it's a little easier to find meaning. Boom. And so I'm not saying that atheists are meaningless. I'm just saying if they really sit in a room and really wrestle with why, there's not a lot there. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I mean, life is weird, right? We come in kicking it and is. screaming. It We're is. here for a brief moment and then we leave We're kicking out. and screaming. Right? Yep. It's just, it's just, it's just tough. So, um, yeah, so I can't even remember the question. You, you got no, fired you, up. Yeah. yeah. You you nailed it. Yeah. yeah. It's because we were great. talking about Princess Bride before. I that know. got me going. We got really excited. <laughs> yeah. but, but you're talking about something that I think, especially for, you know, I don't, not to just isolate or point out only millennials, but just people, in, you know, as mm -hmm. we're coming out of the college years, moving into the work world, we, we so undervalue and don't expect to have to prepare. We just expect to walk yeah. into the dream thing right away. And yeah. so for those that are hearing today and thinking about, am I in the career that I want to be in forever? It may be a, a road that, that leads to that, but it, it will take time and preparation and yeah. work and, and yeah. it will maybe feel like suffering sometimes, yeah. but putting in that time so that we can walk into, uh, you know, ultimately what we want to do or feel like God's calling yeah. us yeah. to do. So like, let me, let me just share this. So I had a conversation with a young man in our church who wanted to pr pursue a career in music. That was desire, mm -hmm. but also was dating a young lady in our church. And um, I, I said, those are two different roads. So, so here's what was making him miserable is he was pursuing at the same time, two different goals of happiness. Mm -hmm. One was a girl who was here. The other was a dream in Nashville. I, and I, 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 it, this was a shocker to him. I'm like, those are different places, right? I said, you need to identify the dream. Mm -hmm. What's the dream? And this is what I would say for every young person. Instead of running around saying you're miserable, sit down and ask yourself, what is the dream? For me as a Christian, here's what's given me the most happiness. My dream is to love and serve God, mm -hmm. to love and serve my wife, and to love and serve my family. The, the, that's my dream. That is how I define happiness. Um, 
You know, like for example, I always hate it when someone points out a guy and says he's successful. So you notice we say that about rich people, oh, he's super successful. Well, what if he's been divorced six times? What if he doesn't have a friend in the world? Mm. So what the world qualifies success as is famous, mm -hmm. wealthy, yeah. accomplished, smart. Mm -hmm. um, and many of those people are very, very unsuccessful relationally. Yeah. They don't have depth. They're not moral. Mm -hmm. They're not wise. I mean, these are the things that I am trying to be in my life. I know very wealthy people who are very unwise. Mm. That's not success for me. I don't want to be married to multiple women. I want to be married to one. That's challenging, but I'm up for it because that, to me, happiness is, is finishing the race with her. Mm -hmm. Tammy used to get mad. What's your goals for the year? I want to stay married. She used to get livid. <laughs> right? That's because, a good goal. because to That's her, good goal. it was an assumption and an mm. expectation. And, and to me, I, I disagreed with her. I yeah. think it was a goal. And it's going to take work. Yes. And you knew that. Mm -hmm. My wife, you know, bless her heart, love her, was raised by an alcoholic father. Which, what, what is the source of alcoholism? It's not just addiction, it's the inability to deal with stress and difficulty. Hmm. So an alcoholic drinks to avoid. So she grew up in a household where, how do you deal with stress and pressure? You avoid, avoid it. it, you get hammered. Yeah. Which ultimately, guess what, caused stress <laughs> and, 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 pressure. And, and pressure on her and her sister. Mm -hmm. it, it provided an, an environment of chaos for her, but she wasn't given the tools uh, growing up. And by the way, no family is perfect. My mom and dad weren't perfect. We, we all inherit, yeah. inherit, there's the word, inherit the brokenness of our parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you don't think you were impacted by the most significant relationships in your life at an early age, you are lying to self. You are not looking at uh, any kind of research mm -hmm. on human beings whatsoever. <laughs> um, it's, you have been impacted and affected by your parents more than you think. Now, yeah. don't blame them because you're an adult now and you need to change and be different. But those those relationships are, are significant. And so right. to me, meaning for me comes from relationships. I want to have deep friendships. I want to have long lasting friendships. I'm still, I'm still friends with a person from fourth grade. Now you can't stay wow. friends with everybody because you, you have to have a friend who also values friendship mm -hmm. because relationships are too, is two directional. Absolutely. Um, you know, um, you, you know uh, I was listening to this guy today who said, we shouldn't say those friends are so close. They're like brothers. What you should say is, those brothers, but those brothers are so close. They're like friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, because actually, you know, f sibling relationships are challenging, yeah. uh, but friendship relationships, you know, it takes two directions. Yeah. It takes two parties that are interested. And in. so right. I'm interested in depth. I'm interested in longevity. You know, the friendships that I value the most are those ones that have been with me through the years. And right. I just really, really appreciate that. So. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for just like, I think even redirecting the whole concept of meaning there. Cause I think a lot of us look at like, Oh, is the work that I'm doing producing something meaningful right. rather than yeah, like looking at what actually meaning is. Yeah. yeah. And this is why I think the concept of marriage is so important. So I think most men derive meaning from work, not all. I mean, I'm sitting in a room with two female professionals, yeah. which I'm sure you want meaning from your work, but most men de derive meaning from work and lack relationship. Mm -hmm. Most women derive meaning from relationships uh, and and not work, which in there is the inherent conflict between men and women, uh, which is why many of us are disconnected from our fathers, um, because they they their mark for success was work. When you know, what, and this is why I think again, heterosexual marriage is so important because what I think women typically teach men, and I know my wife has taught me this, is the value of a relationship. The you know, my, my focus, right, is on my career and bam, I'm going there. And my wife's always said, hey, we're, you're going to be here. Um, and, and having said mm -hmm. that, I've pushed my wife because my wife's laser, her focus is laser, like real, real small. And I've said, hey, there's a kingdom of God out there. There's life beyond family. And, and we need, to, and so mm -hmm. I've been able to push her in that manner as well. And we've really, really worked together. And so, again, you just need to ask yourself and be real. I believe these things will make me happy and write a list. Mm. And and don't lie to yourself. <laughs> Come on. Don't lie. Peep, man. Don't do it. Don't do it. Be real with yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, because some guys need to write down, I believe having sex with Maxim models will make me happy. Be write honest. that down. Yeah, be honest. Write that, that down. It, you know, because, okay, well, that's shallow um, and um, probably not attainable. So, you know, so what are you going to do with your life? And right, I believe, I believe fancy cars and big houses and lots of money. I believe that being famous, having, 
you know, a hundred thousand people following me on Instagram. I, 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 whatever it is, write it down. Yeah. Because you, you're, you're never going to, you're never going to be happy until you're honest about what you think will make you happy. Wow. Right. Cause, cause you got, you got to look at, you got to look at what the, what the right, wh- where, where do you think you're going? Yeah. And so, um, um, really, really write that down and, and then ask yourself, are these things shallow? Are mm-hmm. they moral? Mm-hmm. Are they biblical? And if they're That's not, right. what has to change? Um, cause there's no Bible verse about having a hundred thousand followers on Instagram. Mm. So, Preach. yeah. So, I mean, Jesus says, beware of the crowds, beware. And we got all these Christians pursuing a platform rather than pursuing a personal relationship with Jesus. And it's sad. Yeah, It's so sad. And then we wonder why all these Christian celebrities keep falling. Fame is a disease to yeah. our faith. It yeah. is. It is. All That's right. good, man. Wow. A lot of good stuff in there. That's great. So Ernie writes in a really good question about work and balancing that. I love that name. Ernie. I loved Bert and Ernie when I was a kid. <laughs> Ernie's the man. It, dude, I love that show. Ernie, wherever you are, you're the man. Ernie, we thank you. And uh, your friend, Bert. <laughs> Bert didn't write in this week. He'll probably write in a question next week. So Ernie asks, as Pastor Matt talked about happiness in the workplace, I completely agreed with him. I think that my father taught me pretty well about how we are not always going to love our job, but as fathers of children and providers, we do what we need to do to provide with a smile on our face. What I'm struggling with is this. What if the workplace you are in is not allowing you to attend or serve at church? I know the easier answer is to find a new job, but what if this is the only skill you have and letting go of the job would put you and your family in financial ruin? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a real difficulty. So let me, let me challenge that, Ernie. We have church on Wednesday nights. We have church on Saturday nights. We have church on Sunday mornings. If you do not have a job that can give you one of those times off, I would really challenge them. I would actually hire a lawyer and take them to court. And, and, and here's why it's important. Listen to me, Christian listeners. Muslims are doing this. They're fighting for the rights to for their faith. And Christians, yeah. we completely give up and give in, and it's ridiculous. You have the right to religious freedom, and your job cannot take away your right to worship as you see fit. So it needs to be reasonable, mm-hmm. right? You can't say, I need all of Sundays off, but I need Sunday mornings off. So sooner we're going to open a campus again, and we'll have Sunday night services again. I mean, we may eventually have services you know, every night of the week because we realize we don't live in a culture that honors you know, the Sabbath anymore. Uh, And if you guys don't understand why we have weekends, a lot of you have never thought about this. It's because many of our founding fathers were very, very religious. And so they set up a work week, work week, work (laughs) week, where we work Monday through Friday and we get the Jewish Sabbath off and and the Christian Sabbath off. They gave us both. Yeah. They, that, that's Praise. what we got, right? Praise God for Jews Amen. and Christians because we got both off. Uh, now, Muslims typical, I believe, uh, Holy Day is Friday. So it's a little bit different. So, but we don't have a Muslim culture. So th- that's, uh, we didn't, we weren't raised in a Muslim uh, ethic. It was a Judeo-Christian ethic. So, so listen, we, you need to figure that out. So we have Wednesday nights at our Woodcrest campus. Uh, we're going to be having Sunday nights at another campus soon. We have Saturday nights. We're trying to do this Um. But you can't say, well, I need to watch Pastor Matt Brown live. That's ridiculous. My, wa- my wife watched this weekend from um, Idaho. Mm. She watched online. So you can do that. We're making everything accessible. Um, you need to get to as many worship services as possible. Please yeah. don't quit your job because then the church has to take care of your family, which I don't want to do. Right. So you're right. You absolutely need to do that. But you may have to move. And this is what just drives me nuts is Christians are like, well, I got to worship on Sunday mornings because I always did it that way. Well, me too. But so get over yourself. It's not about you. It's about worshiping God and connecting with God. I would say at least once a week, a lot of Christians think they go to church. I, the, the Christian tradition is once a week because we work six days and one day we pause for rest and worship. And if you're not doing that, you are not living in Christian rhythms. And that may be the reason that you're unhappy because mm. you claim to follow Jesus, but you're living a rhythm that is an American rhythm, not a Christian rhythm. So the Christian Jewish rhythm is we work six days and one day a week we rest. Mm. And it's for faith, family, and re- you don't work on the yard. Faith and family. Okay? Mm. I mean, it, it just is. That's right? good. All right. 
Thank you, Ernie. Love you. Yeah, thanks, Ernie. So then this last question on the workplace comes in from Jeremy. And he says, my best friend is miserable miserable every minute of every day in his job, not because he doesn't make a difference or his job is boring, but because he works in a hostile and toxic work environment. The leaders are corrupt micromanagers who constantly degrade and demean him. He's doing everything in his power to find another job. But until then, what are some practical steps he can take to survive? Mm. Yeah, I would say this. Man, what on earth does God need to do in me? Jeez. <laughs> I mean, Sorry, right? Jeremy. I mean, because right there, there, there's got to be a lesson there. So, so that's what I would ask myself. Man, what is it that I? And maybe it's just this, you know, toughen up, Buttercup, right? So mm. maybe that's that's the lesson. So, like example, I, man, when I was in boot camp, it was not encouraging. It was not uplifting. <laughs> man, I, my my drill sergeant was a sociopath. He actually was removed by the United States Army and imprisoned because the dude was crazy. Wow. I had a guy wow. break his leg, break his femur in front of me, and my drill sergeant was screaming at him to stand. <laughs> right? Yeah, lower that's your little, expectations. That's, that's workplace violence yeah, lower, right there. Lower those expectations. Yeah, my, my drill sergeant also threw a rucksack, a 75 round rucksack out a three story window and it landed on one of our heads. Yeah, and he yelled at the guy for not being aware of his surroundings. <laughs> it, this dude, this dude yeah. was literally insane, which sometimes, guess what people? Our, we live in a, what was the verse? Crooked and perverse generation. generation. Some people are not just crazy. Some people are evil. They're evil, mm. right? In our culture, we can't we can't say those words. You can't help evil people, right? The, the mm-hmm. Bible repeatedly says, God, deliver me from evil people. Yeah. Pa- the apostle Paul says, God, deliver me from unreasonable men. Unre- I mean, some people are not reasonable and you need to get out of that situation. So yeah. w- what I would say is, wow, what do I need to learn about life? What do I need to learn about the situation? How do I find another job? But the truth is, sometimes you got to endure it. You got to toughen up. And you just got to work through it. And guess what this is going to do? It's going to make you appreciate your next job. Mm. Right? Amen. So so there is beauty in this suffering. Your next job, you're going to be thankful. Yeah. You're going to be grateful. You're going to be a better employee because you hopefully- Contrast. Yeah, there's contrast. Mm-hmm. And you're going to, yeah. man, you, you, man, you know, I mean, I would love to have you at Sound Church because you're going to think I'm great. <laughs> come work for me, you know, because yeah. th- we don't have that. Um, uh, but some people come to work for Sandals Church and, and they think I'm awful. Because they've never had another job. Mm. And they don't know. They oh my gosh, Pastor Matt wants me to work like 40 hours a week. Yeah. yeah that's that's a, your contract. That's a, that's a work right. week. Yeah. I yeah. mean, oh my gosh. Come on, dude. Um, and, 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 you know, that's, that's usually difficult. Yeah. Um, so I would just hang in there and, and, and just know, man, not all suffering lasts. Yeah. I mean, right? Psalms 23, pray it every day. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Mm. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me and you anoint my head with oil. Where? In the presence of my, of my enemies. enemies. Mm. That's good. For thine, right? So you, so you got you to you memorize that. Again, go back to Philippians 2. We're in Philippians. What happened to Jesus Christ? His work week stunk. Yeah. It was rough. Like you think you've had a bad work week? Read the Passion Week. It's brutal. It was, a, it was bad It's week. brutal. Yeah. So um, just know that you know, um, I mean, and, and uh, by all means, guys, you know, you're not a slave to your job. You have rights. You know, th- there are laws. People can't mistreat you. People cannot ask you to be immoral. They cannot ask you to violate their faith. And there's great places to work. Right. So so find something else. You may have to. So here's part of the problem. A lot of people stay in, in work because, again, make the list. Some of you, your, if you're honest, your, your happiness comes from making a certain income level. So maybe the reason you can't find another job is you're not willing to lower your income level. So really what you believe makes you happy is a certain amount of money mm. that you make rather than maybe a little less and be more happy. Hey. So I talked about, you know, the guy that pumped my septic tank this week. You know, he said he made three, four times the amount of money working in the world. And now he pumps poop for a living and loves it. <laughs> he loves it. That's not the job for me. Amen. But you know what? If that guy, I mean, that's a crappy job. Come on. I see, you're pumping see what you did there. Yeah. 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 If that guy can love his job, you know what he told me? I get to work for myself. I set my own hours hmm. and, and, I, and I make good money. And he happy. did make good money. Yeah. I paid him 1500 bucks. Hey. That's an expensive poop pump. Right? 1500 yes. bucks. How, how long was he there working? A couple hours. A couple hours. Yeah. $1,500. Yeah. It's a couple hours good work. I know. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Jeremy. Thanks yeah. for writing in. Yeah. Thinking of you, man. Hang in there. Love yeah. you, buddy. So we're going to dive into some off-topic questions Whoa. now. We've got a couple of those in. So Sweet. Karina writes in. Not sweet Karina. I was agreeing with you. Sweet that we're going to do this. Yeah. And then sweet Karina. Karina. She's probably she's Karina. She probably is. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I can't assume that she's not that. So Karina, if you're out there and you're a kind person, that's awesome. Uh, she recently read a devotional in which the author states that when Jesus died, he was thrown into the deepest pit of hell. Mm. The reference was Matthew 27, 46, when God says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So the question is this, when Jesus died on the cross, where did he go during those three days? Is it, an auth- as the author states, was he sent to hell? Uh, he went to Denny's. Den- that's a hell of a Which, Sometimes. <laughs> at midnight on a Friday night, oh, he went to Denny's, Denny's no, at, yeah. by UCR. Yeah. And oh, that's, that is that, actually, they have security yeah. outside. Yeah, yeah. The, it's, it's a miserable experience. Oh, man. I like Denny's, though. Denny's starts with no. D. It, Devil it, starts with D. It does. D, the first two letters are actually e. the same. Mm-hmm. E. Yep. See? So if it wasn't Denny's, right. where yeah. would you say Jesus went for those three days? Yeah. So, well, you cannot develop that theology based upon the verse that she just quoted. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Mm-hmm. So what, what that verse actually means is that for the first time in all of eternity, God the Father and God the Son were separate. Mm-hmm. We don't have any idea what that means, mm-hmm. but it was awful. It was more tragic and more painful than the actual physical suffering mm-hmm. that Christ endured on the cross. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the separation from God. It was the abandonment of God. So what is hell? The abandonment of God. You are now on your separation. own forever. Yeah. Yeah. You Here's the word. You're forsaken. Mm. So um, she said that he said that he was in hell for three days. Yeah. Or just like when Jesus died on the cross. Right. So yeah. So, so here's the thing that's crazy, right? Time is something that exists here. Mm-hmm. It does not exist in eternity. So... Jesus could have experienced all, he could have experienced the concept, the feeling, the sensation of eternal judgment. Because we, we don't know what that's like when you leave here and go there. Right. Right. You know, they say that with time travel. So, so people can go at a certain speed and they've remained the same age while we've all aged. That's theoretical. Mm-hmm. But, right, these are not Christians. These are, or well, they might be Christians, but they're mathematicians. Right. They, they're calculating that this is in fact possible, that right. there's a way right. to travel. An equation. Yeah. yeah. Einstein talked about that. So, um, so yeah, three days, according to our time, yes, that's where he was. According to whatever time is that exists outside of this, we have no idea what he endured. There is a passage in Peter that says that when Jesus Christ, he, that he descended and preached to the spirits in prison. Um, you know, I've had a couple years of Greek. Um, every Greek professor that I had said that's the most difficult passage uh, to translate because it's just it's just language that's not used in other sources. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways that you understand Greek language is by other Greek language. Mm-hmm. You understand usage based upon how it's used somewhere else. And so that's how we attribute meaning. Mm-hmm. Um, like even our own culture, when somebody uses a, uses a word that you've not used it that way, it's like, wait, wait, what do you mean by that, right? Mm-hmm. Because I don't, I don't mean mean the same thing by what you're meaning. So even even currently in, in English language, someone can say something and you're like, I, okay, I know what that word means, but we don't use it that way. So it becomes very, very difficult. So the, the usage there is challenging, but the Apostles' Creed, which uh, is a statement of faith that goes back thousands of years, says that we believe Jesus Christ died on the cross and descended into hell. So not every Christian organization holds to the Apostles' Creed. I think it's fine. I certainly think it's biblical. I think it identifies what Christians historically have believed. Here's what I would say. Ultimately, we have no idea what happened. Mm-hmm. But, you know, is so is, you know, is it right to say he ascended or descended into hell? Yeah, it's it's, it's historical, but you know, we don't have the the literal language that says that. We don't know where the prison was. We don't know what happened. We we don't know what that context was. Um, certainly the Peter passage seems to indicate that Christ had some freedom in there. And so in hell, I don't believe that we will be free. I believe that we're eternally enslaved. Mm. Um, so, we're, I mean, that's in prison, the, the whole nature of prison. So he did preach in the prison and Christ had some authority. But again, you know, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that we, we don't know definitively, but I certainly would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's wrong. I would say, yeah, that, that, that's been a historical understanding. But ultimately, I think one of the things that we'll learn about on the, on the, the other side yeah. is what exactly took place. Absolutely. And I think our minds will be blown. So yeah. um, it certainly was not a good thing. Yeah. So he was divorced from God. 
uh, which is, you know, C.S. Lewis writes a great book if you're looking for some casual reading for oh, the summer. Just to The Great it. Divorce by C.S. Lewis. Mm. It has nothing to do with marriage. It has to do with separation of souls from God Such forever. Such a great book. Fantastic Such a great book. book. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, that dude was a awesome. genius. He was. Yeah. All right, this last question comes in from Ellie, who writes, how can we help those who say they can't love or forgive others like God loves and forgives us because they are not God themselves? They feel that that is impossible to do. Sure. Yeah, I, you know, I don't think that we can be like God. I think we try and we aspire and we do the best that we can. Um, you know, um, God has uh, an ability that I just don't, right? He has the ability to forget. You know, mm. your sins are remembered no more. Yeah. I mean, they're, here's the word blotted out. Right. So they're, they're absent. It's, it's not that they, you know, it's not that God just chooses to forgive. He chooses to forget. So God has the ability to mm. not remember. I don't have that ability. Right. So I am wounded in my present state. Uh, and I think that's one of the gifts ultimately that we will have on the other side is the ability to forget those wounds. And that's part of God's wiping away every tear Right, is that um, those memories that were painful and unhealable will be gone. Mm. And, um, and I think we will be grateful for that. And yeah. so um, I know that I will be a much better lover of people and of myself if uh, many of the wounds that I have received from loving people and being mm -hmm. hurt by people would be taken away. Yeah. And I, and I'm by that, I mean, blotted out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, I, you know, I think that we, we, we must aspire to be God by the, and at the same time recognize that we cannot be God. So, um, you know, and, and we're trying and we're doing the very best we can. And so, um, I would just say this, try to be better, try, try to, try to forgive more, try to, um, you know, give more grace and do that. But the reality is, man, some things happen in life that you will never recover from in this life. Mm. Mm. You just, you, you, you just won't fully recover until we are fully recovered by Christ. And that's, man, that's the key. So my, my heart goes out to you and my prayer for you. And I would just say, God, here, here would be my prayer. God, help me to be more like you, mm. you know, and, and which, okay. And what should that do? It should not cause us to feel bad about ourselves. It should cause us to worship Jesus because he did it. Yeah. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So rather than self-loathing, start praising Jesus, right? Oh my gosh, I can't. Thank God Jesus could. Mm. And so again, it, it should prompt us to, to, to worship. worship of him rather than, you know, mourning self and, and, and being like self-defeating and man, I can't do that. And I mean, read the Psalms. Those people weren't very good Christians, you know, <laughs> smash them, kill them, destroy them, knock their teeth out, smash their babies against the rock. Ooh, yeah. That's a little, that's a rough thing. Yeah. I've never, I've never prayed that. No, that's good. But they were real. You've always said that, yeah. but they were real. Mm -hmm. They were authentic in those yeah. prayers before God. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, be real with that and, and just know. And here's what I would say is, as long as you know that that's what you should be working towards and pray that maybe one day God will do a miracle in your life. Uh, I mean, sometimes God does a miracle and he takes away cancer. And sometimes God does a miracle and he takes away pain. It is possible. So, but those are miracles. They don't happen every day. Usually right. what happens is we have to live in the midst of suffering, which is okay mm. uh, because there is joy to be found. And, um, you know, um, you know the, the prayer of serenity, right? Um, you know, what, it, it's, it's, it's God, give me the wisdom to know what I can control and can't mm. and focus on what I can control. And so focus on the things you can change. And, and what we can't change is what people did to us. What we can do is not give those people control over us for a whole life. So some, a lot of times people were wounded as children and they allow that person who wounded them as a child to control their entire adulthood life. Don't give that person that power. You mm -hmm. take the power, you're an adult, you're safe, you can heal, you can grow. You may not forget, it may not be gone, but you can change and you can find a level of happiness. And, um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the books that's on my list is a book that is written by um, a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust who talks about many of the Jews who were set free from the camps, never healed, yeah. never grew, never changed. And so um, he talks about why. And mm -hmm. that was just really, really important. So yeah. some people can heal and it's not circumstances. Yeah. So, right, not every rich person is happy. Not every rich person is miserable. Not every poor person is happy. Right. Not every poor person is miserable we have a part to play in that process. And so um, I think our culture worships victimhood. I think that's a reality mm -hmm. uh, because when we are victims, we are not responsible. Mm -hmm. God is going to hold you responsible, not for the things that people did to you, but 
for your response to those things. Right. And so we need to own that and say, okay, yeah, that was wrong. That was not right, but I'm going to move on. I'm going to change. Because here's the thing. If we, don't, if we don't ever stop becoming a victim, we're going to wound our marriage, our relationships, our family, and our kids. We're going to yeah. pass on that dysfunction. And then now who's the perpetrator? It's you. It's us. So you've got yeah. to change and you've got to deal with how you feel. So great yeah. question. So good. Yeah. Well, that was a great episode, guys. Uh, we are going to have notes for this episode on our website at debrief.show slash 68. And we'd also love for you to send in any of your questions that you have for the show there. Just go to debrief.show, click the red button to send in a question, or you can look at any of our episodes. They're listed there on the website. It's a great resource where you can also share that with friends. You can also follow us at Debrief Show on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We've got great quotes there that we'll share. We'll share the episode there, make it as easy as possible for you to get this episode out mm -hmm. and share it with your friends. And watch us on YouTube. Everybody watching, yeah. good to see you all. We're happy that you're seeing us and we're not seeing you, but, but if we, we know could, that you're there. We, we feel your presence. So thanks <laughs> for being there. Yeah. And if you'd like to support Sandals Church and the debrief, we would love that. You can text give debrief to 951-900-4120. That's a great way to give directly to the debrief. Or if you'd like to give to Sandals Church, you can go to sandalschurch.com slash give and give that way too. Boom. Yeah. But now before we wrap up the episode, we're going to uh, share some words of affirmation oh, that folks man. have been sending into the show. A little throwback to our this like is that's a new. Total Christian yeah, I haven't done there. this before. This uh, is fun. So Tim, you want to take away with our first one? Yes. The first one is from Steve Brown, not your dad. Whoa. Yeah. Not your dad. Call him Steve, not your dad Brown. Steve, not your dad Brown is what we wanted to say. Uh, he wants to thank you for the Beyond Happy series and the debrief. The timing of this series for him is a true blessing, as I am and will be undergoing chemotherapy throughout this summer. My reliance has been placed on God, and I have continually seen doors open and my path made smoother. Focusing on how God is blessing me through this experience is bringing so much joy that I find myself sharing that joy with my family, friends, and caregivers. So Steve mm -hmm. wants to thank you. Yeah. yeah, Steve, I'll be praying for you, man. So here, here's, here's the gift of impending death. It makes you appreciate everyday life, mm -hmm. right? So you have perspective that we should all have, but we don't. We take every day for granted. And hopefully from this point forward, you won't. And you will live every day to the fullest. And that's yeah. my prayer for you as you suffer and as you go through the treatment that's really, really difficult. Thank yeah. you, Steve. Appreciate you. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, and this last one comes from Josh in Jacksonville who says, Josh. I live on the East, East Coast, telling all my friends and family about Sandals, the debrief, and the PMB getting real. Mm. Since coming across Sandals and experiencing the real with self, God, and others has totally transformed my walk, walk with God. I'm so thankful to you, Pastor Matt, and those at Sandals. I'll forever be tuning in. And if you're ever in the Jacks area, hit me up for some cycling and hey, brew. An invite. Yeah. You want to roll? Let's Jacksonville do that. where? Uh, Florida. Florida. Let's go. Oh, yeah, yeah. I drove through there. Jaguar yeah. country. Probably less turbulence coming into Jacksonville. I don't know, I man. Imagine. I hope I think so. it's me. <laughs> hey, but let's see if, if Josh says I can roll too. Let's let's do it. Mm. Yeah. Some cycling. I'll pass on the cycling. Yeah. I'll just do the brew. You yeah. guys go handle that. You want to make sure that we knew that it was coffee. Oh, like, clear. Yeah, just yeah. to be clear. Just yeah. to be yeah. clear. Yeah. Whatever you're going to do, Josh, that's cool. I can have beer if it's gluten-free. Hey. That's <laughs> so lame. It's, it sounds kind of... But I'm not going to be miserable. I'm going right. to choose to be happy. Choose joy. And enjoy... You can still have it. My sorghum-based beer. <laughs> <laughs> 